Do you like books? I mean, really, really like books? Then you're in the right place. Each week, your host, Sam Hankin, interviews the best of today's top-selling authors and the up-and-coming superstars of modern literature. This is The Avid Reader. Here is your host, Sam Hankin. Hey, everyone. Thanks so much for joining us again on The Avid Reader, brought to you by Wellington Square Bookshop, which coincidentally happens to be my bookshop. So today, our guest is Blake Bailey, author of probably the most anticipated biography of our time that of Philip Roth. Uh, Blake is also the author who gave us the biographies of Richard Yates and John Cheever. Uh, what was it that, oh, Blake said, insofar as my books have an aim, it's to reconcile the paradox of a highly compartmentalized personality, which is no mean task with Philip Roth, you know, who said, <laughs> don't rehabilitate me, just make me interesting. So Roth picked Blake as his man, and we'll hear about that. And after years of effort, and close to 900 pages. We have to, today in our bookshop, plenty of the books and uh, there's a copy um, and we have some behind us. Uh, so we're selling them every day. Uh, they're out front, they're on the front table, they're in the window. So the life, the work, the loves, the misogyny or not, the cruelty or not, the heroism and generosity. Let's find out more about the man who wrote some of the best books of this and the past century. So welcome, Blake, and thanks so much for uh, joining us today. Well, thanks for having me. It's good to be here. Well, so I guess the, the coolest question that I've heard asked, and I know you're asked all the time, is how the hell did you get the job? Uh, right. I was, this was uh, 2012, early 2012, so nine years ago. Um, I was coming to New York uh, to drop off photographs for the book I just completed, which was my Charles uh, Jackson biography. And uh, I was having breakfast with uh, James Atlas, who's the biographer of Saul Bellow. And uh, at some point, Jim said, uh, did you hear that, that Ross Miller is no longer returning Philip Ross phone calls? Well, as, as we in the, in the trade knew, um, Ross Miller, whoever the hell else he uh, was, which we didn't really know, um, had been Philip's biographer for a long time. As I would presently find out, Ross was the nephew of the playwright Arthur Miller and a good friend, indeed, Philip's best friend. So his best friend had been his biographer. Um, I had communicated with Philip um, while I'd been working on my Cheever book, because he and Cheever were kind of friends, and I knew his mailing address, so I dropped him a letter and I said, I understand you're between biographers, I'm going to be in town soon, uh, shall we get together? And he called me back and said, by all means, and the rest is history. Hey, tell the story, well there's two, one about what he said about wish he, what he wished he had done with Ally McGraw, and then he said, okay, you got the job. Oh, my God. Uh, <laughs> we were just chewing the fat, and at one point, um, we were talking about movies that had been made out of his, uh, out of his books, and, uh, and I said, well, the best one by far is uh, Goodbye Columbus, the movie, in, in terms of adaptations. And I said, uh, you know, I'm, I'm a big Ollie McGraw fan, and that's kind of where it all started for her. And he said, you know, um, he either said, I could have taken her out or I could have met her, something like that. And, uh, and I was, was genuinely astonished and said, well, why didn't you, man? <laughs> and, um, and he looked thoughtful, and he said, okay, you're hired. <laughs> so... <laughs> Well, the other one, I don't know if you want to say it, but you said it in the book was, if you tell him what you said about Cheever, if I can write a book about a... Yeah, yeah, yeah. His, uh, he interviewed me. He interviewed me for like three hours. Um, and he had this sheaf of notes on a legal pad. And the first question was the only one I was prepared for. And it was, um, why should a Gentile from Oklahoma write the biography of Philip Roth? And I said, I'm not a bisexual alcoholic with an ancient Puritan lineage, but I wrote a biography of John Cheever. Which, by the way, is what he wanted to hear. Um, you know, Philip said throughout his career, um, I am uh, not an American Jewish writer. I am an American writer who happens to be a Jew. 
and uh, though he certainly was not an anti-Semite, as he was sometimes charged, especially early in his career, he loved being a Jew, and he loved living among Jews on the Upper West Side of Manhattan. Um, he did not want to be mm, judged through that lens. He liked the fact that I was John Cheever's biographer. Yeah, and, and the other thing is, and I'm just going through the, what I consider the trilogy, of uh, the actual engagement. And it's also a good idea about being interviewed, you know, give answers that they don't expect, you know, whether you're interviewing for a job or whatever, th those were great points. But the last one, which is, could be a dedication of the book is, don't rehabilitate me, just make me interesting. Yeah, don't rehabilitate me, just make me interesting. Uh, you know, Philip knew that he was, um, that that whoever wrote his biography uh, was going to get a lot of flack, both directly and otherwise. Um, and in a way, he sort of, uh, he wanted accuracy. He wanted himself to be portrayed in the round, very much so. But <laughs> whenever, uh, you know, he knew that I was in touch with somebody who was going to give an unflattering account of him, I would immediately get a memo from Philip. <laughs> You know, which would very carefully explain why this person wasn't entirely reliable. And these are the points that I should probably be a little skeptical about and so forth. So he kind of wanted his cake, have his cake and eat it, too. He did want to be rehabilitated to some extent. Hey, Mike, ask what you think is your most important question about this whole, the whole deal. Before I ask that question, Blake, I want to tell you that I've spent the last four days immersed in your book, finished it at 8.15 this morning. Um, <laughs> and I wouldn't ordinarily say this, but I was knocked out. Oh, thank you so much. I think it's eminently fair. And also, I think you're that rare biographer that didn't have an axe to grind. No, I, I uh, thank you for that. Um, that is perhaps the thing I pride myself most about. Um, I'm not a pontificator, and, and I don't go into any project with any sort of preconceived ideas or, you know, I mean, a highfalutin moral agenda at all. So let me start with my first question. In reading this, I noted several times, just my own notes, that Philip Roth was a man who refused to be cornered. And that whenever he felt refused to be courted or cornered, C O R N E R E D. Cornered. Got it. Okay, thanks. Right. Could you speak to that? I mean, is that was that your impression? Um, give me an example of being cornered. I'm not sure what well, exactly. Well, those marriages, but also, even more importantly, his refusal to be pigeonholed as a particular kind of author, a regional author, a Jewish author. Um, a realist author, a surrealist author. I mean, he fought against those, it seemed to me, he fought against those labels his entire life. Um, yeah, I mean, Philip was uh, congenitally opposed to any sort of simple-minded uh, generalization uh, in his work, in his everyday life, period. Um, and quite rightly, in his case, he refused to be pigeonholed as a writer because uh, that would have been patent nonsense. Um, no writer of the first rank in America evolved so much over the course of a career. Uh, um, you know, he started over his 55 years as a writer with Goodbye Columbus, which is a delightful, charming satire about mid-century suburban Jews. Um, then Portnoy's complaint, 10 years later, was this incredibly uh, filthy, ranting, kind of farcical satire. And uh, then he kind of returns to a Jamesian mode with that first Zuckerman book, The Ghost Rider, with its very careful uh, narrative architecture, its, its careful diction, etc. And eventually he becomes this writer who was the funniest writer alive, becomes a writer essentially of tragedies. Um, in the American trilogy, and then, of course, with the Nemesis books that followed. So you can't pigeonhole Philip Roth. I mean, to compare different books from his oeuvre is apples and oranges. Um, moving on, and I'm just going to quote from Maggie Martinson's journal. Oh, good. Okay. To set up a question. 
And at one point she says, how terrible this longing for a mate. But I, I want to flip away from her to Philip Roth because it seemed to me that there was this tension in his life. He did long for a mate, but two disastrous marriages. <laughs> but all of that loneliness contrasted with his demanding work habits. And at the end, there was one point where he, uh, he was speaking about Thanksgiving being his favorite holiday. And Barbara Sproul, when he was with her, making these wonderful Thanksgiving feasts. And you say, you have Roth saying a little wistfully, Thanksgiving was my favorite holiday. I miss those days. So I yeah. wonder if you could speak about that tension between his loneliness and, and his work habits. And um, Philip never wanted to be married. And uh, in the case of both of his marriages, speaking of being cornered, uh, he was rather cornered into them. Um, and <laughs> to his deep, deep later regret in both cases. Um, but on the other hand, he did want, you know, he, he his, one of his favorite Flaubert uh, maxims was, you know, to, 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 to cultivate an orderly life so that you can be, you know, wild in your art. Um, and especially those early days in Connecticut when, when he was with Barbara Sproul, um, who was really kind of the perfect mate for Philip. Um, she was smart. She was disciplined. She had her own stuff to do. You know, she was getting her Ph.D. She was a good cook. Uh, she was beautiful, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, Philip needed that orderliness, and he liked, uh, he liked domestic life. You know, he liked having a nice mate um, who had dinner ready when he finally knocked off from his 12-hour writing days and so on. But he was never, monogamy for Philip was never on the agenda with Barbara or anybody else. And that was okay in Barbara's case because she didn't particularly mind. Why she eventually dumped Philip, and I want to underline that, she dumped Philip. I mean, for those of your listeners who think Philip is this uh, cad, um, was because she wanted to have children, and he just wasn't going to do that. So, there you have so, it. So, jumping around, and Mike's been pounding this into me for the past five years, the plot against America. There's a prescience about that, that you know, you discuss, but how, what formed in his mind that allowed him to portray something that eventually actually kind of happened? Um, a mystery about Philip that I that I hope I uh, investigate ably is uh, that he just made disastrous uh, stupid stupid decisions in his everyday life in his private life but he cultivated a kind of profound wisdom um, when he was solving the problems of his work the geometry of his work as Flaubert would have it um, and yes uh, he wrote this novel about what would it be like if during this very anti-Semitic time in American life, and arguably every time is an anti-Semitic time in American life, but particularly then, what if an anti-Semite like Charles Lindbergh had been elected by the far right and had instituted a number of insidious programs against the Jews and had kind of given air to this uh, dark sentiment? that's always roiling about this far beneath the surface. And sure enough, um, within uh, a year or so of Lindbergh's election in the novel, there are pogroms and there are 30,000 Jews fleeing across the bridge to get out of Detroit before they're murdered. Um, and Trump is elected and he is a bigot and a xenophobe and a scumbag and a liar. And sure enough, we, in short order, have Charlottesville we have the Tree of Life synagogue shooting in Pittsburgh, and we have the white supremacist insurrection against the Capitol. Um, read Plot Against America if you, wanted to, if you want, want to familiarize yourself with someone who saw that coming. Yeah, Mike's been telling, I, and I feel bad, but Mike's been telling me that for five years, and I should have done it. <laughs> and I will do it. Do it. Uh, uh, the other thing is, with regard to bringing him back into the present, which he still kind of is anyway, is the Me Too movement and this constant barrage of 
as I said in the introduction, misogyny. And he asserts the exact opposite throughout. Well, you know, <laughs> uh, yeah, Philip thought, nothing made Philip angrier and more bewildered than being called a misogynist. You know, he he had, you know, lifelong friendships with formidable intellectual women. His favorite editors were women. His lawyers, Shirley Finger, Fingerwood and Lynn Kaplan, were women. His agent was a woman. His lifetime mentor from Bucknell, Mildred Martin, was a woman, and uh, so on. Uh, but it is complicated, <laughs> you know, uh, because Philip uh, did sexually objectify women, and he did make incredibly tasteless jokes about it, you know, read Sabbath Theater, read Portnoy. Um, in Sabbath Theater, Sabbath wants to leave uh, money for a scholarship for the senior, for the graduating um, female who fucked the most professors <laughs> over the course of her four years. I mean, you make those kind of jokes and you're, you're asking for it. Um, and finally, he married a famous actress who deeply resented his adultery and abandonment. So here we are. I wonder if you could uh, just speak about his work habits, especially the discipline when he was under so much pain and suffering so much towards the end of his life. Um, yeah, I mean, it's, it's simply amazing. I mean, most writers write their, do their best work around the ages of 40 to 50 because you're old enough to have you know practiced your craft and gained a certain amount of life wisdom and that translates into your best work and you also have the vitality to do it writing is hard work okay if you go into the manuscript warehouse of the library of congress as i have and see the philip roth manuscripts it's like uh, the final crane shot in Citizen Kane, right? When it's going over that enormous warehouse of bric-a-brac until finally it comes to Rosebud, the sled. Um, Philip did his best work in his 60s with the American Trilogy, and that is nothing less than astonishing. Uh, he had uh, coronary artery disease. He had uh, several spinal fusion surgeries. His health was miserable all his adult life. Um, and yet he stood at that standing desk every day for hours and hours and hours and plugged away. See, anyone who wants to say, oh, you know, Philip Roth had this raffish uh, private life, bear in mind, most of his waking hours were spent alone in a room at his desk. Talk about, since he was prolific, Talk about that statistic that has been quoted maybe more than any in your book about the poll of great authors asking what are the best books of the last century. And this right. I mean, in, in 2006, uh, the New York Times canvassed 200 literary critics, scholars, writers, etc., and said, name the best American novel of the last 25 years. And on the final list of 22 novels, six were by Philip Roth. Now, bear in mind, that 25 years from 1981 to 2006 was less than half of Philip's 55-year career. And prior to 1981, he published Goodbye Columbus in 1959, which made him the youngest ever winner of the National Book Award. He published Portnoy in 1969, which is on the modern library list of the greatest English language novels of the 20th century. And he published many novels after 2006. So this is arguably the most astonishing career in American literature. Where would you place him um, in contrast or comparison with other American novelists since World War II? At the top. Wow. Vis-a-vis -vis who? I mean, Saul Bellow is, com uh, Saul Bellow is comparable. Um, he John Saul Updike Bellow. is comparable. He said, what? Saul, he said Saul Bellow was a better author than he was. Oh, and he believed it. Absolutely. Um, yeah, I mean, he didn't say that once to me. He said that three or four times. Um, he thought Bellow was untouchable. He thought the only comparable figure to Bellow in American letters was Faulkner. Um, 
I, I don't agree, uh, but 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 that's very subjective. I mean, Bellow simply is not to my taste. Um, sort of uh, too formless. I don't like his insistence on a spiritual dimension. You know, Humboldt's Gift is a delightful book, but there's all this stuff about Rudolf Steiner's anthroposophy, yeah. and I'm just not down with that. <laughs> so so there you have it. But, but you, anyone is free to disagree with me. Could you speak to his memory? Now, uh, for example, there, there were two moments. One uh, had to do with the novel Deception when uh, one of the woman's voices he was able to bring back. He said it came off like a scroll. And, but then at the end of his life, when he stopped writing, he does these memory exercises in bed before he goes to sleep where he tries to recall every person he's ever known and every place he's ever lived. Did he ever surprise you with his memory in the course of this or? Um, actually, you know, Philip had transmuted the raw material of his everyday life into fiction um, so assiduously over the course of his lifetime that he remembered the fictional version much more vividly uh. than he did the real life version. And many times he would give me uh his and and unlike Cheever, Philip was not a fabulous. Philip believed in accuracy. He he tried to tell the truth. Um, Cheever was was a shameless liar. Um, <laughs> but you know, I mean, he'd say, "I can remember like it was yesterday." I'm quoting him exactly. I can remember like it was yesterday, sitting on my Persian rug in my apartment on East 81st and eating a, a, a barbecued chicken and watching Carson. And suddenly Capote is slandering me on Carson, you know. And I have his a letter from 1969 when, when that allegedly happened where he says to his lawyer, Shirley Fingerhood, I didn't watch the show. But I heard about it. No, so he wasn't remembering what happened in actual life. He was remembering his fictional version of that in a draft of Zuckerman Unbound. See, and that happens. That happens. I mean, anyone who's tried to write fiction is quite familiar with that uh, phenomenon. Is it really true that, uh, and this was the funniest thing in the book, that when he was honored and they had the plaque about he was the greatest did he actually write a copy? For oh, my God, yes, of course. Um, <laughs> <laughs> the historical marker on his uh, childhood home in We Quick, uh, the Jewish section, well, then Jewish, um, of Newark, um, it says Philip Roth, one of the greatest writers of the 20th and 21st century, and goes on and on and on. Philip wrote every syllable of that. Of course he did. That was Philip. Let me quickly just tell you. I mean, again, this is this is Philip to 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 a T. Um, during our first ever conversation over the phone, at some point, kissing his ass, I said something like, um, "So, how many Library of America volumes is in your edition at this point? Is it five, six, what?" And he said, "You know, I'm the last person to ask about that." affecting this kind of Olympian indifference to his own uh, glory. No, he was the first person <laughs> to ask about that because he wrote every word of the jacket copy. He culled the blurbs. He did all that stuff. Ross Miller, the putative editor, did nothing, okay? Philip liked to tell the story about <laughs> when he had lunch with uh, Isaac Bashiva Singer um, in... Uh, Florida, around Miami, um, Singer would always insist on going to this particular Denny's because it entailed crossing Isaac Singer Boulevard. <laughs> and and he'd always, Singer would always point to the sign and say, that's Isaac Singer Boulevard. It's of no consequence. <laughs> that was Philip. Um, anyway. Uh, what about what I, I've called his Stockholm Syndrome? Uh, <laughs> I mean, it's so, especially <coughs> the bench that he would sit on and the things he would say about the bench and why the hell the bench is there in the first place, I have no idea. But what about the Nobel Prize? Look, um, of course, Philip, of course, Philip wanted the Nobel Prize and he deserved the Nobel Prize. Um, you know, the Telegraph the, 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 in, in London uh, 
had an editorial um, saying to the Swedish Academy, "You are if you do not give this to Philip Roth, you yourselves are going to lose credibility." Um, and and many people believe that <laughs> Philip himself believed that, um, but he also kind of kept it in perspective. He he. He knew past the point he wasn't going to get it, and he knew why he wasn't going to get it. I mean, he knew that uh, that the Swedes would never forgive him for Claire Bloom's leaving a doll's house, <laughs> and uh, they don't like books like Sabbath Theater. Okay, so that wasn't going to happen, and he kind of knew that, but he would have liked it to happen. Hmm. And um, you remember real quickly. <laughs> I mean, there is ample reason to believe that the Swedes deliberately trolled Philip Roth, <laughs> that the most fun they got out of, you know, every October was denying him the prize. And <laughs> so after <laughs> after t 23 years pass without an American winning, right, Tony Morrison got it in 93. And everybody knows Philip's not going to be around much longer. And in 2016, they give it to Bob Dylan. <laughs> I, I was gonna... that, that totally trolling Philip. And, uh, you know, so they ask him, Bob Dylan just won the Nobel. What do you think about that? And he said, it's okay, but next year I hope Peter, Paul, and Mary get it. <laughs> it's a great response. Yeah. Hey, um, it's so fun. It's so much fun watching you because after all this time, you still laugh at these stories. They still delight you. Isn't that weird? Uh, Philip, Philip was Philip was the funniest man alive, um, especially that first week in Connecticut. I spent six hours a day interviewing him in his studio, and he was in such a good mood. He didn't have to write anymore. He loved that. And here was a biographer, and the biographer was a dude, <laughs> which he really wanted. And, uh, you know, he could tell all his... Uh, no one was more delighted than Philip with a new audience. Okay, so he could tell all the stories, he could tell all those jokes, and he was in he was in heaven. And so was I. Yeah, you can tell. I want to go to the ending of your biography and his last days. And I mean, I was, were you present? That's my first question. My second question is, if you weren't, I mean, there were tears in my eyes when I was reading the end of that. All of those, all of those ex-lovers gathered around him at the end. I mean, just a wonderful, wonderful ending. Catherine sitting there holding his hand and weeping. Um, and then that ending in the epilogue where, he's, where you have him saying, love, 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 love. I mean, just marvelous ending. Can I read how Cynthia Ozick uh, describes that ending in her front page uh, New York Times book review review of my book? Yeah. Yes, um, I haven't read that yet. We only read the first one. He uh, says, no. oh, oh, great, thanks. Um, no, no, she no. Writes, that's, that's, she calls that's it a narrative. Good. She calls it a narrative masterwork, and it is on the front page of the New York Times book review this Sunday. Um, she writes, while he lingered at the brink of death, his hospital bed was ringed round with young adorers, veritable disciples, former lovers, friends reclaimed, and more intimate friends whose loyalty was steady and seamless. He lay like the biblical David, a dying king, a maker if not of psalms, then of a tower of sardonic, tempestuous, and tragic imaginings. Despite the flood of stricken mourners, he belonged to nobody, and nobody belonged to him. It's pretty cool, isn't it? It is. <laughs> Philip was alone at the end, um, despite all the people who came to kiss him goodbye, m myself among them. Um, oh. He, you know, usually when you're in the cardiac ICU and, you know, you've received terminal sedation, only your family, your immediate family, can see you. Philip had no immediate family. Uh, he had no partner. Um, he had us. So, and the nurses adored Philip, so they let us just sort of mill in and out, and while well, he took his last rasping breaths, and it was quite a scene. It was quite a scene. I was, I was glad to see it. It did me a lot of good. 
Hey, what if you what if he was still alive now, looking over your shoulder? How do you think he would have attempted to edit some of the if he? Would? <laughs> I, I think the part where he uh, calls his lover Inga from London and insists that she listen while he jerks off over the phone <laughs> and she's waiting with, you know, patients outside her door at her physical therapy practice uh, in Litchfield, Connecticut. I think he probably would have excised that part and, and quite a few others for that matter. You know, again, I don't want your listeners to get the mistaken impression that because I'm fond of Philip that I, you know, did a, a puff job on him. Um, if you've read my book, you know that, that uh, I emphasize the bad um, just as duly as the good. And I think that's one of the reasons why I liked it so much. Um, Thank you. But, but I also came across with the impression, and correct me if I'm wrong here, that you, you like the guy. Um, I hope you came uh, across. I, I hope you you left with that impression um, because I did, and um, you know I do think that if you give all the themes, bad and good, of a person's life, um, the 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 relative emphasis that they 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 deserve, that it kind of comes out in the wash. You know that a person's humanity comes through, and, and I do think that. Um, Philip was a very flaw. He had terrible flaws, um, but his virtues uh, certainly outweighed them. And speaking just to one of those virtues was this amazing generosity. Right. Um, Janet Habhouse, Veronica Gang, Emmanuel Dongala, Alfred Kazan, and I could, I mean, that list could be twice as long as that. Remarkable. If 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 you were a friend of Philip's, uh, and especially if you needed a friend, if you were kind of alone in the world, like his editor Veronica Gang when she got brain cancer, um, he'd do anything for you. He'd do anything for you. Um, you know, he not only covered; she had no health insurance. He covered her medical expenses. He phoned up all her friends, got them to pitch in. He visited her in the hospital practically every day. And he did that a lot in his life. Uh, his friend Jane Moss from Bucknell visited her every day when she had cancer. Janet Hobhouse, his old girlfriend, you know, they had not been an item for however many years. It had been almost 20. Um, and he was there the day before she died, and he paid for her burial and so on and so forth. So, yeah, that was a lovely quality in Philip. There were others as well, but he was loyal and he was big, big, incredibly generous. Let me circle back to his books for a second. Um, among all of his books is 31. Which one is your favorite, the one that you think is his greatest achievement? You know, again, it's kind of apples and oranges because you like different books for different reasons, and they're so uh, they're such different productions. Um, but probably if I had to pick one um, on pain of death, I would pick The Ghost Rider. Um, which is the first volume of that. I mean, it's just, it's, it's exquisite. It's a perfect book. And it's funny. It bears constant rereading. Um, it, it's just, it's, it's lovely. Um, I, I can't do it justice with any sort of impromptu spiel. I just hope that your listeners will read it. I was, I was going to say, speaking of which, and my questions are kind of different than um, Mike's. This one is directed to you. You know, I'm not comparing you to Samuel Johnson's Boswell, but it's like you really, really. I had better access than Boswell. Go ahead. It's just that I, I wonder what it is that drives you to get inside these people, and they're all incredible people. And it, it's like you choose them, not necessarily in this case, kind of. It's like you choose. Oh, them. you have to. You have to choose them. I mean. If you're not intensely, intensely, transcendently interested um, in a writer and, and his or her work, um, then you are going to make yourself miserable for five or six or seven or, in this case, nine years because um, you're going to be with it every waking hour. I knew, because I love Philip's books and I love the books of all my subjects, that's why I write the books in the first place, um, that it was going to be uh, a great challenge and an intriguing one and and that there would be no dull moment and there there were there weren't any so you were immersed in this for 10 years nine years 
nine years. Uh, I came to this project in May 2012, and uh, you know, I mean, right up to publication, there was work to be done. So my question is, and this is maybe a little odd, but do you dream of Philip Roth? Um, yeah, I had a terrible dream. <laughs> Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> About Philip Roth. Um, yeah, it was, it, I, I don't want to go into squeamish no. uh, detail, but um, after he died, um, those kind of a relief for me as a biographer that he was no longer looking over my shoulder. It was a terrible loss for me as a human being. And for various reasons which are irrelevant, um, I was going through kind of a bad patch in my life. And uh, yeah, I I can't believe I'm I'm telling you this. Um, yeah, it was it, it just I I I dreamt he had just died or died a month ago I guess, and uh, I was at this party and I knew nobody and nobody knew me, and Philip was there and he was obviously dead. Something about his eyes, but he was there. He was corporeal and he was milling around and nobody was aware of him except for me. And I threw myself into his arms and wept. <laughs> That's my Philip dream. Wow. That's pretty interesting. That That's is... kind of heavy, isn't it? Yes. <laughs> now, now I want to ask about dreams about John Cheever. <laughs> I, 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 I'm pretty sure I would never dream of throwing myself into Cheever's arms. One, he was too runty. So. You spoke, or Philip Roth spoke a couple of times, and I'm sorry I'm jumping around here, about, this is a quote, the brutal business of beginning a novel, and also at one point he spoke of writing a novel as ghastly. So there's this, uh, could you speak to that at all? Did he speak? Look, you know, I mean, he always said that the first drafts are terrible, you know, and I can attest to that. I've seen his first drafts, and they're terrible. Um, the only, uh, no, no, there were, there were basically two books out of 31 published books that came easily to Philip. One was Goodbye Columbus when he discovered his genius. It came off like, like it came off a spool in his head. Um, and, and it's, it's pretty seamless. And, uh, Sabbath Theater, which, you know, he was finally free of Claire Bloom. He was the happiest man on the planet. And uh, he was just having a whale of a time. Um, but a, a good example of something, you know, of his usual method of working is one of the many Ur versions of Portnoy's complaint. And what he was trying to do yet again for the, I don't know, umpteenth time, was write about his first wife's urine deception. You know, uh, when he said, you need to leave, she uh, she said, I can't, I'm pregnant. And uh, he said, prove it, gave her a jar. She went to Tompkins Square Park. She found an obviously pregnant woman, paid two or three dollars for her urine, and thereby fooled uh, Philip into marrying her because he thought that she was pregnant, okay? So he was trying to turn that into fiction again and again and again and again. It wasn't working. So he's trying it again with Portnoy. Yeah, you know, and uh, on a, just real quick. Uh, so, so there is uh, about 150 pages about Erica, the Maggie character in this manuscript. And it's, it's no good. It's no good. It is flat. It is dead. Um, and then the Abravanel, the Portnoy character, was then called Abravanel, um, starts talking about his mother, okay, which is the source of the crippling guilt that led him to, you know, succumb to Maggie. And immediately it starts getting funny, okay? It starts becoming, it, it comes to life on the page. The coin begins to ring. Um, and that's what Philip said, you know, sometimes he said in a first draft, sometimes I can write 300 pages and there's one sentence that's alive. So I throw it all out and I go with that one sentence and I start over. He's not exaggerating. That's how he worked. You think that's easy? <laughs> it ain't. Yeah, horrible. So let me go to your, to your process and the wealth of material that you had to work with here must have been overwhelming, but... There, there are certain details that just, <laughs> when I read them, obviously you had chosen them, that I sat back and said, oh my God. So Philip Roth is in Prague. 
and he goes to a museum and there is a little boy's Mickey Mouse doll with the Star of David. I mean, at that point, and that was on page 359, I just sat back and said, I mean, you have it nailed. That detail alone just, just rung me out. How do you, choose, well, how do you, you make you. those kinds of choices as a biographer? Yeah. Well, you, you do have just, a, by the time you're finished, you know, you've been going to the Library of Congress, where, again, there's the Citizen Kane-like warehouse of Phillips manuscripts. You've interviewed 150 people and transcribed the interviews that other people have done with another 50 people. You've interviewed Philip uh, for six years. Uh, you have thousands and thousands and thousands and thousands of pages of material. Um, which is why the most important part of the process for me is not necessarily the research itself, though I think I'm pretty assiduous about that, or even the writing. It is the winnowing. It is determining what are the themes here and what amidst this vast amount of material, what best serves those themes. And uh, that's what I spend the most excruciating uh, time on. I mean, I spend... With Philip, I spent two or three years just structuring and winnowing down and getting everything into its exact place before I wrote a word of finished prose. So I think there are some good details in there. One of the things that's fascinating about his writing is even way back when, he was kind of like the first guy that did a kind of meta kind of fiction where you have a character that's named Philip Roth it's breaking down the fourth wall from time to time and incredibly autobiographical. But that was kind of a first, especially the character name. Well, right. He, uh, <laughs> Philip hated uh, theoretical labels like metafiction and so on. Um, Philip had to figure out the geometry of each novel as he went along, what best serves the story he's trying to tell. And his first foray into meta metafiction so-called um which is calling attention to a work of art as an artifact you know that, that in other words um this is something being made up and i want you the reader to be aware that i'm making it up that it didn't really happen okay um was when he was trying to fictionalize maggie's urine fraud okay and he kept trying to improve on the known facts, and it wasn't working, okay? Every time he tried to fictionalize, it didn't live up to the actuality, okay? So finally, he had this stack of manuscripts uh, attempting to fictionalize this. None of them were worth a damn. But he chose the two best, Salad Days and Courting Disaster, where he turns in one, he turns Maggie into this sort of idealized version of herself, where she's a kind of sympathetic character, and the reader's heart is supposed to go out to her. And Salad Days is another fictional version, okay? And he puts them at the beginning of my life as a man. And he says, here were my attempts to fictionalize this story. Here's one, goes on for about 20 pages. Here's another, goes on for about 15 pages. And then you come to... Peter Tarnopel, My True Story. And in that, Philip tells it exactly the way it happened. Hmm. Okay? And it was basically a way of telling the reader, I did my best to fictionalize this, but I throw up my hands, and I'm just going to tell you what happened. And he did. All right, who else does that? <laughs> Philip did everything. Philip did everything. What is that 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 uh, that, that Lethem says uh, toward the end of my epilogue? You know, Lethem was a, was a great fan and acolyte of Philip's. Yeah, here it is. Um, Roth's thirty-one books, as Jonathan Lethem put it, quote, encompasses and transcends modes of historical fiction, metafiction, memoir, the maximalist or putters in, the minimalist or takers out, the picaresque and the counterfactual, etc., and so forth, being the sort of writer who in his generosity half blots out the sky of possibility for those who come along after. That was Philip. Jonathan Lethem gets it. Philip yeah. is the sky above us. 
And uh, Charles Yu, who I've interviewed a couple of times, just won the National Book Award, and his characters are routinely named Charles Yu. And I asked him about that, especially since it's Yu. <laughs> you know, it's <laughs> right, about- right. There you go. I mean, right away. But yeah, it's like, you know, the, the, that documentary about Hemingway that's on PBS right now. It, it's basically, you know, a Sun Also Rises. He's taking these people and turning them into horrible caricatures when he, like Loeb, <laughs> who he loved, but then turns into this horrible person. Um, yeah, I'm try- I can't believe uh, Robert, Co- Robert Cohn. <laughs> Robert Cohn was boxing champion, at, middleweight boxing champion at Princeton. Um, and, and yeah, 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 exactly. I think in the first draft of, of The Sun Also Rises, he didn't change names. You know, he no, just he wrote it exactly as it happened, you know, in Pamplona. And then he went back into it and sort of, I, I don't think it's a terrible caricature. I think that, uh, I mean, certainly there's there's there was a book published called The True Gen. And... G E N, but which was Hemingway's term for you know the genuine, the the, the real truth, the nitty gritty about anything, and uh, it's great because uh, this this person who compiles an oral biography, okay, and he talked to Harold Loeb and he talked to all these people who had been long dead because he'd been doing he he'd been on this project for something like thirty years, and Harold Loeb was very pissed off. <laughs> About, you know, his only claim to fame was playing this pathetic, you know, Robert Cohn in, in The Sun Also Rises. I mean, that will make you bitter. Um, but uh, other people said Hemingway pretty much nailed it with Robert Cohn. Oh. So so caricature may not be the most used uh, in, in terms of Hemingway's The Sun Also Rises. They're mean, but are they caricatures? Anyway, how did I get off on Hemingway? I've awesome. been watching the Hemingway thing, too, all three yeah, it's nights. Great. And, yeah, uh, And Mike's the one who told me to watch it. The other guy is the same guy he didn't particularly like, like Norman Mailer. It's like Capote. He writes the same way. He takes his best friends, right? Yeah, well, certainly in uh, Answered Prayers, you know, I mean, the, the little bits that he managed to eke out of that unfinished novel were all about his swans, his society ladies that he'd been cultivating all his adult life, and uh, and then and then viciously, viciously uh, skewers and publicly shames. But you know, Capote is an interesting guy, uh, and I strongly recommend to your listeners that they read Gerald Clark's uh, biography of Capote, uh, on which the the movie with what's his name. Um, Philip Seymour was, Hoffman. Was the, the guy who died of the, the actor. Yeah. Um, yeah. Philip what was his name? Philip, Philip Seymour Hoffman, exactly. The movie with Philip Seymour Hoffman is based on materials in this biography. My point is this, is that um, Capote was capable of just despicable behavior. I mean, he hired goons to terrorize recalcitrant lovers, stuff like that. And he was just a, a pathetic mess for the last 15 years of his life. But you finished that book forgiving him everything because he was, he had it in him to be, to have such ironclad discipline. And he also had a sweetness and decency, you know, those qualities can coexist with their opposite qualities. And they certainly did in Capote's case. Anyway, it's a great read. You know, one of the things that, um, and we are trying to sell your book here, and I don't mean to get off on Capote and Hemingway. Oh, no, I, I like talking but, about Capote. Uh, but, you know, one of the things that, you know, I tell Mike and I both know, you know, people, you know, the cliche, you can't judge a book by its cover. And pub, publishers know that everyone judges a book by its cover. And this is a great cover, which leads me to the fact that the photographs, which you must have had tons of them, and you had to winnow out the ones. They're all great pictures, especially of his girlfriend. Um, Philip spent <laughs> um, months going over his, enor- you know, for his 80th birthday, uh, there was a huge celebration in Newark, and there was this photo exhibition of his life at the Newark Public Library, to which he left the bulk of his fortune. Um, so when he got all those photographs back, hundreds and hundreds of photographs, he went, he took a magnifying glass and carefully identified every person for me 
for me. <laughs> every person in every photograph and put, wrote them down on a post-it and a, put a post-it, hundreds and hundreds of post-its on each uh, photo. And after he died, you know, the police would not let you go back in his apartment. Sorry about that. That will only ring one more time before the machine gets it. Don't worry about it. There we go. Um, anyway, he uh, nobody but his brother Sandy's widow was allowed to go back into the apartment because, you know, you don't want anything to be, you know, everything has to be accounted for. I was allowed to go back into the apartment. And because those photographs, and I knew exactly they were at the bottom drawer, the ones that I had winnowed painstakingly from the vast collection, bottom drawer in his closet dresser. And uh, I said, I need to go to that drawer and get my photographs, and you will see that the box is labeled for Blake Bailey. And I went in, I got them, and I left. Yeah, when I first looked at them, I'm, I'm wondering, how does he know the names of every single person in those photographs? And now you Because can't... Philip knew the names of every single person in those photographs. So did I by the time I, mean, by the time I was done. I, I knew as much as he did. One of the things I took away, two quick questions. And the first is about Philip and the second is about, about um, you and your, your uh, work as a biographer. Um, Philip Roth is, is someone who I've been reading for such a long time. And of course he lived during my lifetime. This isn't like reading a biography of Frederick Douglass or whatever the case might be. So at the end of the uh, at the end of your book, I mean, I felt overwhelmed by emotion. But the other thing that occurred to me is, my God, he should have married Barbara Sproul. She was the love of his life. Yeah, well, he had a lot of regrets along those lines uh, that he didn't marry Barbara or marry Anne Mudge, um, because they were they were really ideal mates. Uh, they were devoted to him, um, but they were essentially independent you know, and sort of let him go his own way. Um, so, I mean, what Philip, what Philip mostly lacked in his final years was someone in his life for whom he was the ultimate concern, okay? And he would have dearly loved to have a child taking him to the hospital rather than having to rely on various friends to do it, which he hated being a, that kind of burden. He hated it more than anything. Um, so he certainly felt the lack toward the end, as, as anyone will. It's horrible to be uh, old and sick and utterly alone like that. Horrible. So my question about you as a biographer, how long will it take you to decompress from this biography? It's taking longer than I thought. <laughs> um, you know, uh, it's hard between projects because not only, I mean, even if you kind of have an idea of what you want to do next, you just can't summon the effort. Um, it's like, oh my God, I got to start uh, climbing that mountain again, and I just don't want to do it, <laughs> you know. And it's especially grim in my case because how how do I top Philip? Well, I can't. That's why, that's why I said at the introduction, it's the most anticipated biography, and it is. And every one of these reviews says the same thing. So the classic question that Terry Gross or Good Morning America or Stephen Colbert would ask you is. What's your next project? And I hate that question, but I'm asking it. Shrug emoji. <laughs> <laughs> That's my answer. No idea. I, I kind of have an idea, but I, I ain't talking about it. Well, you have no idea, but you have an idea. Okay. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah. All right. That could change so many times. I mean, I can't. Right. Imagine. Exactly. This exactly. must feel as if you've. Uh, as if gravitational forces no longer apply to you, you must be floating at certain. It's points. like poor Ali, you know. Um, he beats Foreman, and then he he, he fights Frazier in Manila, and he just gets his brains kicked out, you know. Mm -hmm. um, but somehow he manages to survive it and win. And he just says, "Why am I? Why? Why am I doing this?" You know, and and yet he goes on doing it, but his heart's not in it anymore. You know, and that's 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 the great tragedy of of Ali's career. He didn't stop after the after the thrill in Manila, and he got his brains beat out. Well, I hope his quote, his famous quote, is not the same as you're feeling right now, which was, um, 
this is the closest to death I'll closest to death yeah yeah well <laughs> go ahead. no i i'm i'm going to survive but <laughs> But I do feel like, you know, this is this is kind of the best I got. And it's all gravy after this. I just don't know. Well, to conclude, I guess I would say, and we've been talking well over an hour. Um, I guess I would say one thing that sticks with me regarding this interview and what you were saying about not being able to kind of decompress, if that's the right word, is that you seem so, it's the laughter. You laugh, and yeah, you laugh all the time about these stories. And I'm wondering, okay, you've done all these interviews and and yet you're still like so happy. It seems like you're happy about it and you're laughing at all these stories, but you know, it's been nine years, but that's the coolest thing about yeah, it. Yeah, well, well, thank you. I, I have a reason to be happy. I'm proud of the book, uh, deeply proud of the book. Um, and as as you've noted, um, I like reminiscing about Philip. He was a delightful, darling uh, man. Well, thanks so much for joining us today. I'm glad Mike Thank was you here. Thank you so much. And uh, yeah, it was a pleasure. Thank you so, for having me. It was one delightful. last thing before you go. He I never mean, stops. I'll never <laughs> stop. But this is important, though. Um, and I just want you to know that that I think this is a great book. I think this is a great biography, primarily because um, it makes it, it takes nothing away at all from Philip's humanity, despite what he did or did not do with women, et cetera, et cetera. I mean, he was just a remarkable human being, and I think you've captured all of that. Thank uh, you for saying so. Generous, I appreciate that. Thank you that. so much. Uh, it's been a pleasure. Okay. Okay. Bye bye. Bye.